So for our third keynote speaker, uh, our, keynote, our third keynote speaker, Professor Rufa Hagoko Giam, is a retired professor of sociology at the Mindanao State University, General Santos City. She is a cultural anthropologist by training, having studied at Siliman University and the University of Hawaii. Professor Giam has published numerous articles and chapters in books, largely focused on topics about uh, child soldiers, gender and armed conflict, gender and livelihoods among internally displaced communities, peace and development communities uh, in the context of the armed conflict in Muslim Mindanao. Uh, and lately, she has been working on transitional justice in the Bangsamoro communities in Mindanao. She was a senior Asian public intellectual fellow of the Nippon Foundation and has held visiting research fellowships in Kyoto, Chulalongkorn, University Kebangsaan, Malaysia, and Rikyo University in Japan. Currently, Professor Gagoko Giam is one of the conveners of the independent working group on transitional justice dealing with the past in Mindanao. In between her expansive cons consultancy work, she writes a fortnightly column in the opinion page of the Philippine Daily Inquirer under the banner Criss Crossing Mindanao. Since 2019, she was engaged as the National Gender Equality, Disability, and Social Inclusion Advisor for the Pathways Education Program that focuses on education for children in the Bangsamoro. In 2020, she began her current stint as the Senior Strategy Liaison and Inclusion Advisor of the same program. So we would like now to welcome uh, our third keynote speaker, uh, Professor Rufa Kagoko Gia. Mam Rufa. Thank you very much, Aaron. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, first of all, I thank the organizers of this um, international conference for de uh, global de decolonizing studies and for making me a part of uh, the panel of distinguished keynote speakers. I'm truly honored. I do not claim, like the two speakers before me, I do not claim theoretical rigor in my presentation. But I would like to uh, present to you some random thoughts of my work in Mindanao. And I think uh, these random thoughts might be raising more questions and answers, which is what I really want to achieve in this talk. Um, um, and I hope I will not be, you know, like just rambling on mindlessly. I assure you, I try to be as mindful of the things that I have to say this afternoon. Uh, the world has never been the same since colonization the domination of some countries over others became the daily reality in many people's lives in different parts of the world, including Mindanao. It is sad that this act of subjugating other parts of the world has been justified with the myths of white supremacy or of its more uh, so-called benevolent version of the white man's burden. However fictive and mythical this was, it became a strong push for mostly European nation states to claim ownership of countries seen as less civilized in the Eurocentric framework of civilization. And this includes the Philippines. Of all the imperial and colonial powers in the so-called old world, it was Spain that trod deep and insidious impact on the archipelago that they call the Philippines in honor of a Spanish monarch, King Philip II. For more than 300 years, from 1521 to 1898, the Philippines, that included the Mindanao and Sulu Archipelago, was under the rule of the Spanish governors general, who governed under the mandate of the Spanish crown. On December 10, 1898, Spain and the United States of America signed the Treaty of Paris, where Spain ceded to the latter the whole archipelago in exchange for 20 million US dollars. This happened after a mock battle in Manila Bay, where the Americans were the victors and as such were entitled to the spoils of war, and one was, of which was the Philippines. The treaty, however, took effect in April of the following year. Starting the turn of the century, 1900, the Philippine archipelago of islands, including its southernmost parts, Mindanao and the Sulu archipelago, 
officially became an American territory. American rule in the country lasted for more than 40 years until the U.S. government granted the Philippines its independence in 1946. While the number of years of their domination over us was much shorter than that of Spain, their impact was even more insidious and long-lasting, that up to this day, all of us carry such influence in our daily lives, however many of us despise it. That includes myself. Reviewing the pages of our colonial historical experience is like going through thousands of pages of painful narratives of subjugation, domination, even of slavery to Spanish and American masters who ensured their footprints became the mold upon which local, quote-unquote, Filipino national character and individual personalities were shaped. Such impact is palpable even as we move towards a process of purging ourselves of the wide-reaching influence that colonial powers have over us. This process that we are not talk now talking about in this conference has also engendered a prolonged impact on many aspects of our lives as citizens of a 74-year-old republic, from the individual to the collective, from the political, economic, social, and cultural. Such a phenomenon has also spawned a, multiple, a multitude of tensions and contradictions in the way we conduct our daily lives. In fact, the complex whole that we call Filipino culture for many of us is now, a, is now, I would consider, a mosaic of shards and shades of predominantly Spanish and American elements and a sprinkling of all the other minor cultural elements that found their way into our ancestors' lives during the reign of the two colonial powers. We have come to accept some concepts heuristic and epistemological frameworks as universals that we have to use to assert our own voice and agency. And I think this was thoroughly discussed in the previous two presentations. Quite, ob quite oblivious to the existence of indigenous knowledge that guided our ancestors in our distant past. So here we are now trying to objectively discuss uh, decolonization, its history, how it has become the new wave in trying to make sense of nationalist and independence movements of rebellion and of the former colonies. For me, it will help us in our journey towards extirpating the last remaining vestiges of colonial influence in our lives when we first accept that full decol decolonization is still a work in progress a project that has not reached its terminal phase yet. The Bangsamoro people struggle for self-determination and their current regional autonomy project is one such phenomenon. The different groups that fought for the Moro or Bangsamoro right to self-determination never, never labeled their armed struggle as an expression of decolonization. However, the aim of such a struggle was to reclaim an inherent right as peoples have their own distinctive identity prior to the onset of colonization. Several historical accounts of authors like Aijas Ahmad, uh, Rudy Rudil, Peter Gowing, Samuel Tan, among others, have noted the existence of the Sultanates, for example, in the southern part of the archipelago that were established as segmentary states that expanded or contracted depending on the military prowess of the reigning sultan. The first sultanate of Maguindanao, for example, was recorded to have been established by Sharif Kabungsuan, a scion of the sultanate of Johor, who started the conversion of many local datus to Islam, especially in the Cotabato River Valley area. This was in 1515. This meant that the sultanates were already functioning as proto-nation states when the Spaniards first came in 1521. Under colonial rule, the Moro or Bangsamoro peoples have shown their steadfastness in their assertion of sovereignty and self-determination that emanated from the sultanates. They also demonstrated such fierce defense of homeland and religion to various iterations of anti-colonial resistance starting uh, 
in fighting against the Spaniards to the American colonial period and even to the government of the Republic of the Philippines. The granting of independence to the Philippine Republic in 1946 did not dampen the Moros fierce resistance against the new colonial forces, which this time was the Philippine Republic. Many Moro former members of various Moro fronts considered the day the Philippine government was granted independence as the day they started living under the internal colonial grip of the central Philippine government based in Manila and run by predominantly Christian leaders. Tensions and contradictions under colonial rule. Uh, in Ahmad's uh, 1986 article, he describes the Moros more than four centuries of struggle against colonial powers as the 400 year war against class and colony. And this has wrought a lot of um, disadvantages on the Bangsamoro, including national oppression, exploitation of Moro ancestral lands and their produce, historical injustices like the exclusion of Bangsamoro historical and other narratives in the Philippine national historical narrative. All these have resulted in the unilateral imposition of the Filipino national identity on a group of peoples that have consistently asserted their distinctiveness based on a common history of conversion to Islam and practicing a way of life around it. Among the many sources of tension in the Bangsamoro starts with marginalization through land dispossession. Land laws that were promulgated during the time of the American rule privileged dominant elites and even the colonial government by imposing the Land Registration Act of 1902, which required all residents or all people in the islands to register all their lands under the Torrens land title. Now under Islam or under the adapt customary law of the Bangsamoro, land is supposed to be held as a trustee. It is not uh, to be held as a commodity for absolute ownership. So this created a contradiction in the way the colonial government looked at land as part of capital, while for the Bangsamoro, land was part of God-given uh, assets that they should take care of, not to dispose of as, a, as absolute property. Aside from the marginalization through these land laws, there were a lot of massacres of Moro people. One of the most celebrated was the Budaho massacre in Holo in 1913 under the command of General Pershing. And ironically, in Sambuanga City, you will find a plot the main uh, recreational site of the city of Sambuanga is called um, Plaza Pershing in honor of this governor general who ordered the massacre of Moro people in Holo in 1913. Aside from that, there was a series of bloody pocket wars that contested the state uh, on the part of the Moro rebel groups. Uh, they also, the Bangsamoro rebel groups also opposed Philippine government sponsored migration of families from Luzon and the Visayas to various parts of Mindanao, including areas predominantly, predominantly populated by Bangsamoro groups. This started in 1913, where government established enclaves of settler communities or agricultural colonies. And this later on led to the altering of the demographic profile, causing a minoritization of indigenous groups like Bangsamoro and other indigenous groups, according to Professor Rudy Rudian. In 1968, the Dribidaha massacre happened where several uh, Taosug youth were massacred in the island of Corridor, and this triggered the creation of the 
Moro National Liberation Front and the launching of the Bangsamoro Armed Struggle. Uh, can you please show the slides now, Aaron? Okay, so the second one, please. Okay, so after the bloody wars uh, and offensive by the MNLF, the Philippine government had to deal with several um, representations from the organization of the Islamic Conference to find a just, durable, and comprehensive political solution to the problem of Southern Philippines through negotiation. This was uh, embodied in Resolution 18 in 1974. Later on, this led to the signing of the first Tripoli Agreement of 1976, which was largely facilitated by uh, the First Lady then, Imelda Marcos. This led to the creation of an autonomous region, or uh, Region 12 and um, Region 9, which included Cotabato and Sambuanga as the core cities of the autonomous region. Then in 1987, a new constitution of the Philippines um, provided for the creation of autonomous regions. And specifically, in, uh, in 1989, former President Corazon Aquino uh, signed Republic Act number 6734, creating the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. Uh, this region, uh, in can you please present the set next slide? Okay. This autonomous region included four provinces, Lanao del Sur, Maguindanao, but later on in a plebiscite that um, was required of Republic Act, the bill that created Republic Act 1954, expanded the coverage of autonomy However, only one province was added, and that was the province of Basilan and the city of Marawi. The seat of the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao starting in 1989 was Cotabato City. And ironically, during that time, Cotabato City was not a part of the arm. Next, please. OK. Um, the final, so-called final peace agreement between the Philippine government and the MNLF was signed in September of 1996. And it was largely facilitated by Indonesia and some other uh, countries supportive of the process. However, there was a faction that asserted its offensives a year after the agreement was signed. And this was the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, as you can see in the picture. Next, please. In the government of the Philippines and MILF peace process that started in 1997, uh, they first signed the agreement on the general cessation of hostilities. And this led to the uh, several, not only uh, formal negotiations, but even back-channeling talks that led to the, the promulgation of the Memorandum of Agreement on Ancestral Domain. On July 16, it was initialed and being ready for approval of the Supreme Court. However, in 2008, 14th of October, the Philippine Supreme Court declared the MOA AD unconstitutional, and this led to another round of skirmishes and violence, uh, which led me to think that truly, when you assert autonomy or decolonization, it is always a violent phenomenon. Uh, I can find resonance with the writings of a Martinican author who said that Decolonization is always a violent phenomenon. The naked truth of decolonization evokes for us the searing bullets and bloodstained knives that emanate from it. Uh, 
I couldn't agree more with all the bloodshed that has been uh, happening since the start of the uh, Bangsamoro struggle for self-determination. But finally, on October 15 of 2012, during the time of former President Benigno Noinoy Aquino, an agreement called the Framework Ag Agreement on the Bangsamoro was signed between the panels of the MILF and the, pan the Philippine government. Actually, this was just a compilation of several arrangements and modalities, uh, agreements on revenue generation and wealth sharing, power sharing, uh, some initial ideas on what they call normalization, and some uh, delineation of Bangsamoro waters and zones of joint cooperation. In 27, March of 2014, the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro was signed. So from the framework agreement, which was popularly known as the FAB, we have the comprehensive agreement called the CAB. Next, please. Okay. It is to be noted that for the first time in the history of the Bangsamoro struggle, uh, the first time that the MALF heard a sitting president talk about the Bangsamoro as a possible juridical entity was only during the starting the time of former President Aquino. And for many Moro rebel leaders, this was a very emotional time of their lives because they were not ready to see that a Philippine president will consider the Bangsamoro as a distinctive entity. So we have a lot of, uh, there was a lot of activities and a lot of optimism uh, raised during that time. Even children participated in rallies to promote the um, campaign for a ratification of a draft Bangsamoro basic law. Next, please. Okay. In at present, we now have the interim Bangsamoro government, brought about by the signing of not the BBL but the Bangsamoro Organic Law or BOL. Later, I will talk about how different the two uh, laws. I mean, the other one was a proposed law but did not prosper. And this one, um, in the present setup, the the leader of the MILF, uh, Murad Ibrahim, uh, is using his real name, uh, Ahod Balawag Ibrahim Al Hajj. So he is considered the interim chief minister, uh, with his deputy chief ministers, his executive secretary, chief of staff, and. They even have an attorney general in the person of attorney Shai Allah Jadumama Alba. Uh, just recently, the transition parliament or the Bangsamoro Transition Authority approved the official seal of the bond, as you can see in the picture, and also its official flag. Next, please. Okay. In addition to the five provinces already members of the former arm, in the plebiscite on January 21, 2019, the city of Cotabato voted in favor of its being a part of the BARM of the new regional government. And now for the first time, the seat of government is a part of the regional government. But in addition to the five provinces, an additional one city of Cotabato, on February 6, 2019, 63 barangays in the municipalities of Aliosan, Carmen, Cabacan, Midsaya, Picawayan, and Piquit, all in North Cotabato, which are not, uh, are formerly parts of Region 12, uh, voted yes to be included in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. Next, please. Okay, according to Section 3 of 
or article and article 1 of the BOL the purpose of the organic law is to establish a political entity provide for its basic structure of government in recognition of the justness and legitimacy of the cause of the Bangsamoro people and the aspirations of Muslim Filipinos and all indigenous cultural communities in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao to secure their identity and posterity to allow for meaningful self-governance within the framework of the constitution and the national sovereignty as well as integrity of the Republic of the Philippines. And I'm showing this to highlight the many uh, limitations of the kind of genuine autonomy the BAM through the leadership of the MLF would like to have in the region. Next, please. Uh, it is interesting to note the wide difference between the preamble of the draft Bangsamoro Basic Law, BBL, and the draft preamble of the Bangsamoro Organizational, uh, Bangsamoro Organic Law. If you notice, in the preamble of the BBL, it was more assertive of the rights of the Bangsamoro people and the inhabitants of the region to establish an enduring peace on the basis of justice, balanced society, asserting the right to conserve and develop patrimony, which is reflective of the system of life uh, prescribed by faith, which is Islam, in harmony with customary laws, cultures, and traditions. And in contrast, in the approved law, which is the BOL, next slide, please, you will see that it is the Filipino people who is initiating the promulgation of the law that grants autonomy to the Bangsamoro people. So this already is a very sharp contradiction to what originally was the intention of the those who fought for a long time for autonomy and those who struggled by legal means to draft a law that would be expressive of the expressions of the right to self-determination by the Bangsamoro people. So I'd like to uh, highlight the following for my concluding insights on this um, presentation. For the Bangsamoro, despite the creation of the BARM and the installation of a ministerial government, which is interim, asserting their brand of autonomy will still be constricted with this being a sub-state of the Philippine nation state. We start that by looking at the preamble of the BOL. The subordinated role of the autonomous BARM is already established with the Filipino people granting the Bangsamoro a franchise in organizing a regional government that has to follow the structure and stricture of the national government. It is still largely a sub-state and as such, all its systems are considered subsystems of how the national government has shaped and will continue to shape national policies. Had the BBL been passed, it might have been a different political path for the fledgling autonomous BAM, and there might have been more elbow room for designing systems appropriate to distinctive context of the diverse peoples in the Bangsamoro. Secondly, the BOL does not grant power to the BAM to create a different systems of, system of governance structure especially in creating a separate regional army or regional currency. Even taxing powers are also limited. So navigating through an autonomy that is provided through a legislation initiated by the Filipino people through the BOL still puts the national government as the franchise holder of political power. This means that the regional government is still subject to the political horse trading rent seeking and other political maneuvering initiated by the national government, government or whoever sits in Malacanang. So cooptation, capitulation, and collaboration 
have become the methods of work for many uh, people in the BAM. And in the past, I remember a work by Alfred McCoy, uh, the Datos of Maguindanao under colonial rule, uh, that he refers to as some as compliant, some as defined. Uh, so all these are taking place. And one of the most recent stark examples of this is during the Marawi siege, after the, in the aftermath of the Marawi siege, there was a lot of silence on the part of Maranao leaders to assert that the Maranaos would really like to create or establish a new Marawi based on their, what is considered the ideal in Maranao culture and tradition. So designing a genuine autonomy reflective of the aspirations of the Bangsamoro people still remains to be a work in progress since the current leadership of the region continues to explore how to move this forward using the overall guidance of the principle of moral governance. This is the MILF-led government of the new BAM. But such a principle needs to be framed in succinct and specific parameters and at the same time be popularly disseminated and accepted among all levels of the regional hierarchy in order to create a strategic coherence in running a functioning and effective autonomy that will spell the difference between the new region and the old one. But this process has just begun. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shukran. All right, uh, shukran, uh, Professor uh, Rupa Giam. So uh, we have some questions uh, being raised right now about your presentation. Uh, one deals with, uh, since you mentioned in the concluding uh, remarks that there are aspirations from different communities in Mindanao, for example, the, the Maranao communities to aspire and work on uh, realizing the ideal in uh, Maranao culture. Uh, in realizing that in their lives. Uh, do you think that there is a phenomenon happening in the barn where we could observe some form of uh, Saudi Salafi Wahhabism uh, dominating the religious life, the people, and somehow uh, having to contend with uh, the indigenous experiences of, of the communities? Uh, thank you for that question, yes. Um... There are now several um, several opinions on um, you know like thoughts and ways of thinking and ways of looking at uh, the phenomenon that we are now facing in the bomb. And this has been uh, discussed in many forums that these uh, extremist views of some uh, Saudi or Middle Eastern or uh, whatever uh, other, um, I, I use quote unquote extremist uh, views, uh, finding their way into the way of thinking of some leaders. And it is possible because there is so much desperation and uh, there's so much uh, exasperation and disappointment in the way the Philippine government has handled the Marawi siege rehabilitation through the task force Bangon Marawi. Until now, the thousands of people who have been displaced by the siege are still uh, dispersed in different transitional shelters and in some of their relatives in other parts of Mindanao. So it is possible that if not checked, uh, if not handled very well, the, there will be a new wave of maybe extremist thought that would influence especially the youth to take up some more uh, insidious 
uh, ways of influencing the general uh, public, causing more problems to not only in Marawi, but it might uh, spread out or spill over to other other parts of Mindanao. Mm. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Um, another question, ma'am, is uh, with uh, regard. Ah, uh, yes, Doctor Alatas, would you like? I'll, to... I'll I'll wait I'll wait my turn. I I just have a. I'd like to ask something. Um, All right. But any whenever you think it's my turn, please let me know. All right, and I I I I'll call you after this this particular question. All right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Since uh, we're already on the topic of. Uh, the indigenous communities and uh, the experiences of these peoples. Uh, there's also a question raised with regard to the institutional dimension of the BARM in relation to the larger Philippine state. Since you mentioned that it is still a continuing uh, project and it is still very much a sub-state, yes. uh, how can you say can the, the bar move forward to actually realizing what you called uh, quote-unquote genuine autonomy? Well, um, in one of my frequent uh, discussions with some leaders of the region, they always express in various ways how they would like to design an autonomy that they like to, to, to conceptualize, not as the national government would like them to, to, uh, to frame. And so I keep on asking them, how would this look like? Mm. And they also say, they will always say that uh, we have to discuss that at length. And I just recently knew that there had been a series of online discussions on what constitutes the principle of moral governance. Mm. And I think it's, a, it's really a work in progress because they want to ensure that all diverse perspectives on these principles will be factored in their design of what autonomy they like to have mm. that would be in keeping with the context that they have and in fact this is also causing a lot of problems in many different aspects of regional governance especially in uh, basic education, for example, because National Depth Ed provides uh, the templates for what is considered as a minimum, that's what they call minimum learning competencies. And hmm. we start with, with a region that has been known to be impoverished since uh, when it was created. Uh, uh, since it was created in 1989, the region has not moved up forward. In fact, it still remains as the poorest region in the entire country with lowest human development indicators, including uh, learning outcomes and educational achievements. So uh, the new government is now challenged to, uh, to a level that would uh, mean that they would have to work even harder in uh, the pandemic is even exacerbated uh, this challenge because they cannot deliver face-to-face -face, uh, educational services but we will have to depend on several donor agencies to support the needs of the learners who are still behind in terms of achievement uh, compared to the national average. So really, it's a, it's a huge task ahead. And uh, they're always saying that we need all the help that we can get. And we need to focus a lot on uh, moving forward. And um, there's not, uh, they would say that uh, what, however you can contribute, you contribute because this is a task that not, not only the regional government can do, but it is a task that all the constituents, whether they are Muslims, Christians, or indigenous peoples, have to work together hard in order to achieve the kind of autonomy they want to have in the future. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Alatas, would you like to raise your question now? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, 
Professor uh, Gulam, yes? Yes, Giam. Giam, Giam. Giam, sorry, yes. yes. Uh, um, uh, I have two questions. Call me Rufa. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Um, I, I have two questions, um, and they are both related to the, the theme of uh, decolonization, decolonizing yes. knowledge. Yeah. Um, the first question has to do with, um, I, I understand that there is among the Muslims in the Philippines um, some disagreement about the designation of Muslims as Moro. Yes. Um, because right. of the Spanish colonial That's origins right. of right. Uh, Moro, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was wondering whether you could, you could comment on uh, mm -hmm. how that debate is going and um, you know, what, what, what they're talking about. Um, that's one question. The, the second question has to do with Rizal. Oh. And yeah, um, you know, I, in my own um, um, reading on Rizal, I find that, I, find, I, I have noted two things. Uh, one is that many of his references um, to Islam um, or to the, the, the Moros are negative. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the Noli, for example, the, the very few references to Islam tend to be negative. Yes. Um, now, in, in a very interest in, in um, his correspondence with Blumentritt, there is um, a letter um, in which he discusses um, um, Spanish colonization. And then he makes an interesting point that um, perhaps um, if the Spaniards had not, had, had not come, uh, the Philippines would have, um, uh, you know, been converted to to Islam, yeah. uh, and he makes the, you know, the point that perhaps it would have been worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you know, now, now this I find to be, you know, extremely um, not only politically incorrect, but but also uh, uncritical, coming yeah. from a man like uh, like Rizal, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and the other thing is, for all his concern with going back to history to recover the pre-colonial past, to correct the distortion of yeah. the, of the uh, Spanish um, uh, construction of Filipino history. When he does talk about the pre-colonial past, like in the Morga, for example, there's hardly any reference to Islam or mm -hmm. to the Muslims, when yeah. surely he would, have, he would have known that Islam was a very prominent part of the colonial past. Exactly. So, yeah. so, so the thing is, if we are to take Rizal seriously as a decolonial or anti-colonial thinker and if the Muslims in the Philippines were to um, to take him seriously because I, I would ex I would think that Muslims in the Philippines in thinking of decolonizing knowledge production Rizal would have to be a very in important uh, resource yeah but how would they appropriate Rizal in, in a way you know uh, and, and reconcile that appropriation with his uh, ambivalent or sort of negative uh, attitude towards Muslims? Okay, I start with a very shallow uh, perception of Rizal, which is popular among many young Filipinos, that, uh, especially Muslim Filipinos or Muslims in the Philippines. Um, they look at Rizal as, you know, uh, how is it that Rizal is considered a national hero when there were others who were more aggressive in fighting against the colonial powers. So that's one. Uh, and in fact, they mention uh, uh, several um, Muslim rulers like Sultan Qudarat, for example, and all the other uh, uh, Magindanao Datus and Tausug uh, sultans who who really fought against colonial rule. But um, that being said, Rizal lives in the minds of so many Filipino students, Muslims included, because it is part of their college course. There is a required, how many units of Rizal? And history mm. is considered history three in many universities. So they have to memorize what Rizal wrote, Noli, Fili, and including all the letters that he has written in that Rizal history course. So that's why Rizal is very well known in contrast to 
uh, Maguindanao and Tausug Datus who fought for uh, self-determination but are never known to many people. Uh, on the use of the word Moro, uh, that's right because the word Moro used to be appropriated by the Spaniards when they uh, first came to Mindanao and were surprised to find out that there were people who worshipped the same religion, who had the same religion as their arch enemy in the Iberian Peninsula, who were their, was this the, for seven centuries, were their oppressors also, were their colonizers. And so, uh, but they were surprised that they were brown and they were, uh, you know, uh, of a different build than the Moors uh, that they knew. And so the use of the word Moro was um, a, Spaniard, a Spanish way of uh, derogatorily uh, referring to the Muslims in the Philippines. But at the time of the uh, rebellion, starting with the MNLF, the word Moro was used by Nur Miswari as a badge of honor. I mean, as a way of saying that, look, we are the group in this country that consistently fought against colonial rule. And so that is a badge that will also demarcate our identity as a group that has a distinctive identity different from all the rest in the country. So that has evolved to one that is derogatory to now as a badge of honor and uh, in the MILF, they've used Bangsa Moro, meaning Moro Nation, mm. from the word Bangsa, which is also Malayu. Um, but there are some people who don't subscribe to that. And one of them, one of the leaders is the governor of Sulu, uh, Sakultan. Uh, and that is why he is opposed. He didn't like that Sulu voted yes to the plebiscite last January 2019 because he would have liked for an independent Sulu province to be existing as a separate part of the region, not part of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. Hmm. However, in the new BARM, that has been the word used, Bangsamoro. So it, it encompasses uh, peoples whose identities are marked with Islam as their way of life. But it also includes the indigenous peoples who have remained in the area and who have decided to call themselves by self-ascription as Bangsamoro. Mm -hmm. And uh, included in that identification are also the descendants of those who were married to uh, ethnic <clears throat> that um, converted to Islam, uh, even if they originally were Christians, but they converted to Islam. So they are also included in the definition under the provision of the Bangsamoro organic law. Mm. So right now, uh, there's not much debate anymore with the inception of the BARM as the new region that replaced the ARM. So it's just an addition of the letter B in the, in the, new, and the naming of the new region, but it is still the same with the addition of one city, Cotabato, and 63 barangays from the former Cotabato province. Mm. Uh, in terms of Rizal, uh, I think uh, one explanation that might uh, explain that uh, why Rizal has been quite negative in his perception of the Moro is, I think, because of Rizal's extensive uh, while he is anti-colonial, anti-Spanish, he was also a creature of Spanish colonization, having you know, been educated in Spain, uh, also um, uh, wrote everything in Spanish, even all his uh, very popular works, like for example, as a student, we were made to memorize his Mi Otimo Adios, or My Last Farewell, and I can imagine that, you know, I mean, this is also my own take that when we become uh, creatures of this um, way of thinking, we also 
try to avoid or uh, intentionally obfuscate some some phenomenon that is right facing right right at us, but we don't consider that significant, and th that I consider to be maybe what happened to Rizal. So, and especially that the narratives of moral um, activists or whatever you call them have been characterized by slave trading, uh, slave raiding, and a lot of violent incidents. So that the frame of mind that exists among many Filipinos uh, educated in the colonial uh, way is that the morals are really the dregs of the earth. They are, you know, they are the violent, they are violent, they are bloodthirsty. And um, if you examine the, what is uh, more than 32 volumes of Dare and Robertson's History of the Philippine Islands, you have pictures of Moro there uh, being labeled as uh, pictures of the savage looking bloodthirsty yeah. Moro. Yeah. Yeah. So that could partially yeah. explain that. Yeah. Thank you. Can, right. can I, could I quick, very quickly um, uh, respond to that? Sure, yes, sir. Please. Um, um, no, thank you very much for your, you know, for, for your ideas. Um, I, I just wanted to say, maybe I'd like to make two points very quickly. Um, I would um, like to urge um, um, Filipinos, but in particular Muslims, uh, to, to, to consider that Rizal was more radical um, um, and more anti-colonial than he's often made out to be. Um, and I think maybe uh, the idea that, you know, uh, he was merely uh, a reformist or merely, uh, or was still an assimilationist um, who was for Hispanization of Filipinos, uh, perhaps is exaggerated and, and, and needs to be uh, revised, as it has been um, uh, very eloquently um, so by, by some uh, Filipino scholars. Notwithstanding your point that the, the Muslim anti-colonial um, activists and, and fighters need to be recognized and that should be uh, a very central part of uh, decolonizing uh, yeah. knowledge production in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, so that's one point. The second point is, um, I, I think based on what Rizal thought about Islam and Muslims, um, one could make the argument that there is an element of, there was an element of Eurocentrism in Rizal's own thinking, um, which has to be uh, brought out uh, because in a sense, um, Rizal needs to be saved from himself. I mean, mm -hmm. if he's to be appropriated, you know, as a genuine anti-colonial and decolonial thinker, those aspects that are in, in, not in line with that decolonial sensibility uh, need to be uh, identified and, and, and removed so that Muslims can appropriate those aspects of Rizal that are truly critical and anti-colonial uh, in order for them to, you know, to, to develop, um, you know, a, a decolonial thought that's um, a truly universal and representative, not just of the Islamic or the Muslim view, but, you know, um, the view of the whole of the Philippines. Yeah. Um, um, so to me, it's a, it's, it's a bit sad. I, I find it, you know, I, sad that uh, Rizal um, doesn't have uh, the place that I feel he should have among uh, Muslim uh, thinkers in the Philippines. Uh, and maybe it's necessary you know, to make these distinctions uh, in order that the genuinely decolonial aspects of Rizal can be incorporated into Muslim thought in the Philippines. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, sir. Really, there should be a re-reading of Rizal's work in order to uh, you know, learn lessons for for people in the Bangsamoro who would like to write local histories, for example, to celebrate the mm. what the uh, local activists have been doing in favor of dismantling the colonial influence. Yes, that would be a good suggestion to reread and revisit what Rizal has been writing about and to learn from that anti-colonial stance. To, to frame their own uh, anti-colonial and decolonizing uh, histories of the Bangsamoro. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, 
uh, since Ma'am G- Ma'am Rufa, since we're on the topic of uh, the term Moro, uh, yeah. there, there's a question here raised by Yasmira Monor. Hi, Yasmira. Uh, about the actual inclusivity of the term Bangsa Moro, since you also raised a while ago that there are contentions with regard to using yes. uh, the term, mm. uh, it can al- actually be argued uh, to be you know, referring to a colonial identity, how inclusive mm. is the term Bangsamoro in the context of a multicultural Mindanao? And also, ma'am, I would like to relate that to another question by Ru Alonto, uh, whether we should separate Moro studies from Philippine studies in general. Uh, would that, what, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, I'll start maybe with the later part of your of the question. Yes. I think uh, well, one of the findings we had, we used to do the listening process uh, as part of our work for transitional justice, and uh, one of the findings was that, um, largely speaking the moral narratives are missing in the national narratives. So that, that's an, an act of historical injustice in that when you say Philippine studies, largely moral studies would be absent. Mm. Okay, so um, I think it's about time that uh, moral intellectuals will come together and define for themselves uh, mm. this type of, uh, because clearly when we say moral studies, it will be uh, deviating from the usual uh, Philippine studies and might be an example of the decolonization of knowledge that uh, Professor Alatas was talking about. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's high time that we forge that kind of uh, subdiscipline or whatever you mm-hmm. might uh, call it because there's a lot to be known that has not been known yet. Uh, When we did the listening process, I thought I already knew about the many massacres that Moro peoples, uh, I mean, communities have experienced. Then uh, because of that, because we went to more than 200 communities all over Mindanao, we discovered that there were more that were not yet written about. So I'm sure that there's a lot to write about in terms of local history, in terms of uh, you know celebrating indigenous uh, knowledge uh, within the area called the Bangsamoro, because there are Tedurai, Manobo, and other indigenous groups in the in the region. Mm-hmm. The appropriation of the word Bangsamoro in the BOL suggests that those uh, identities within the region. Uh, who would be uh, accepting the Bangsamoro identity? They're more than welcome. In the law, they're more than welcome. But of course, they're given the choice uh, still to continue being indigenous people's groups. And the BOL itself recognizes that by a provision that uh, allows for the creation of a tribal university system within the region. So there is going to be, uh, we're now, I'm working with a group uh, through Pathways to, to help indigenous groups in the region frame their educational framework that will be included as part of the education system, subsystem in the region. Mm. So that's, that's uh, something to look forward to. All right. Uh, in relation to that, ma'am, maybe you can give your quick uh, observation to answer Professor Ramon Guillermo's question ah. about the situation in uh, the rehabilitation of the Mindanao State University in Marawi, probably after the siege, right? Uh, he also comments that more than UP, the MSU system has more potential in uh, being an, a truly Philippine academic yeah. institution in Southeast That's Asia. That's right. That's right. Uh, we used to have a very good uh, research center in MSU Marawi. Unfortunately, some time back, it was burnt. This was the Aga Khan uh, Resource Center, and it was burnt. So 
there are only very few that are left behind. And in terms of uh, being a hub for uh, Philippine academics uh, focusing on Southeast Asian studies, especially those connected to Indonesia, Brunei, and Malaysia, MSU can really become a hub of that uh, endeavor. I am saying this because MSU is a system and uh, Mar while Marawi is the center of that system, it has campuses all over, not only the Bangsamoro, but in several key areas of Mindanao. For example, where Yasmira is in Iligan. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, MSU Tawi-Tawi. Mm -hmm. And in MSU Tawi-Tawi, they have uh, the Sama Dilaut Studies Center which is trying to collect stories and narratives of the Sama de Laut, which is a minority within a minority. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember what uh, Professor Alata said about uh, people who are based in land and people who are based in the sea. And these are people who are based in the sea. When we did a listening process with them, we were surprised to, to know that they are more uh, land sick than sea sick because they live in the sea and that's why no housing project will last with them because they don't like to live on land. They prefer to live in the sea. I mean, that's the sea is their world. And so uh, uh, really it, was, it, it would be a good uh, project to rehabilitate uh, the resources that Marawi, MSU Marawi has lost through that fire and also because of the siege that has happened. But uh, the situation at present is still very much uh, problematic and compounded by the fact that Marawi and Lanao del Sur are among the, the locations in the barn with the highest incidences of COVID-19 infection. And so, uh, even the Minister of Health from Marawi also contracted a COVID-19 when he went home to Marawi. So uh, at, right at present, it is in a state of, you know, like uh, maybe we're waiting uh, until when this pandemic will, mm. will end so that uh, real rehabilitation can take place. All right. I think uh, with that uh, particular note, we can end uh, Mamrufa's very engaging uh, keynote speech. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Rufa Kagoko Giam. Uh, we would like to give you a virtual round of applause after that uh, presentation, as well to Dr. Fayed Said Farid Alatas and, of course, Professor Ramon Guillermo. To formally close uh, the first day of the conference, we would like to call on uh, one of our institutional partners, the International Studies Department of Miriam College. We would like to hear from Professor Lorna Kehong Israel. From Lorna. Okay, thank you, Aaron. It has been a long day and it feels long because of the rich and very enriching uh, discussions. But like all beginnings, it must end. Also, on behalf of the organizers, the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies, or the UPCIDS, FISO, or the Philippines International Studies Organization, and the Department of International Studies, Miriam College, I congratulate and extend a huge, huge thanks to our keynote speakers, Sayid uh, Farid Alatas from the NUS, Ramon Guillermo from the University of the Philippines, Rufa Kagoko Giwam from the Mindanao State University, and of course, Mam Tessa Tadem for formally opening this online event. The keynote presentations have opened several insights and action items to chart the colonizing trajectories of knowledge production that remain on the paths of Orientalist or Eurocentric mental map. Part of these action items include looking for exemplars, retrieving sources from which one may begin to build concepts, language, and theories to underscore, for lack of a better English, the dominance of Orientalist or Eurocentric thinking and knowledge making. The decolonizing project of knowledge production may sound very scholarly or academic on the one hand, 
but it is also very political on the other. It asks us to look at our very own kind of thinking, of being self-reflexive so that we become sensitive to our object or subjects of study, lest it contributes to further distortion of our own effort at knowledge making, that we might be producing distorted knowledge. And as Rufa had pointed out, we're actually creatures also of the very thing that we want to change. No? It is political because it implies restructuring the means of or the tools of knowledge production, English language, schools, educational policies, hiring policies, funding, the economics of publishing and authorship, of being grammatically correct, of being conformist to citation style requirements, etc. And this, this is where we are now. It is a double-edged place of privilege because we are equipped with acceptable credentials that are largely also Eurocentric. But it is also a place where we are bound to be disadvantaged because we are likely to be measured as falling short of these Eurocentric um, credentials. But I'm happy to note that those of us who decided to join us in this gathering seem prepared to swim against the current of Eurocentrism so that the decolonizing project may flow and circulate to join other streams of thought, Eurocentric stream included. I would also like to emphasize the use of decolonizing in this endeavor. It is a verb rather than a noun. No? We are engaged in a particular action, a collective endeavor so that we can arrive at that horizon where no knowledge is disadvantaged or privileged or no history is silenced or unwritten. And to this end, I wish all of us good luck and a million thanks to more than 100 participants in this session because your questions are also action items or action points. Maraming salamat, thank you, and we look forward to your presence tomorrow, in the morning, and in the afternoon. Shukran. <laughs>